We decided this, this year for uh, Archives Month that we wanted to do something special for the Albany Fire Department and the Fire Department Museum. And um, I'd like to introduce uh, Rebecca Chevy, whom you've already met as our archivist, who's going to tell you and talk to you and let you know about what exactly we've done to prepare for today and what you're going to be seeing after the presentation is over with. Well, when we decided we were going to do Albany Fire Department, I never realized how much information we had on the Albany Fire Department. Um, Tony Alpaca and Bill Tobler have been working hard on some of the plans um, for the museum and just bringing down boxes after about 20 boxes. I said, this is enough. We've, we've got more than enough. Um, so we broke it down into different sections. The first section you'll see is plans, on, plans and information on various fire departments, the buildings themselves. Then we focused more on the firemen, <coughs> because that's really who makes up the fire department and all their hard work. So we've got two tables basically for them, and then a couple for Albany, various Albany fires and common council minutes describing the fires, which is pretty <coughs> interesting. Um, There's a lot of work that's put into this. The, um, Rebecca, Maura Cavanaugh, and Jordan Glover. She's not here. She's not here right now. The th those three uh, women have put a lot of time and effort into getting this display put together. It's, it's good three months worth Absolutely. of work uh, that uh, you'll be seeing out there. Uh, we will be taking you for a tour of the facility and we'll, be, uh, we'll have uh, Rebecca and Maura and Jordan tell you about the displays that are out there. I think you're going to find <coughs> it very interesting and um, you know we have some refreshments after uh, the presentation is over with. Uh, we just hope you enjoy your day with us today. And uh, now I'm going to get to the, to the, to the main part here, our principal, <coughs> our principal speaker today. Uh, our principal speaker is a, is a native of Albany. He was chairman of the board of the Albany Firefighters Museum for now for three years, Bill? Yeah. For three years. Uh, he's really the one that has championed the creation of this museum that uh, is ongoing, a project ongoing. It's located at 384 Broadway in the former R.B. Wing <coughs> building, if you're familiar with that. Bill has served on the Albany Fire Department from 1971 to 2012. He was a invest fire investigator for five years and was promoted to the rank of lieutenant in <coughs> 1987. As an advocate of the emergency medical services in the Albany Fire Department, Bill served as paramedic from 1985 until his retirement in 2012. Bill was a member of the Albany Firefighters Union, serving as union president for 10 years. He represented the New York State Firefighters on the New York State EMS Council. Bill has been married for 44 years to retired teacher and again, former Albany County legislator, Virginia Mafia Tobler. They are the proud parents of two grown sons who are currently both serving our country in the United States Air Force and the United States Army. And to both Bill and Virginia, thank you for that. If it wasn't for our servicemen that serve us now and in the past, we wouldn't be enjoying the freedoms that we have here today and be assembled in this very room enjoying the program. So we wish them all the best in their endeavors in the Air Force and the Army. And thank you for allowing them to do that. So without any further ado, it's my honor, privilege, and pr pleasure to present to you Bill Tobler. Bill? I'm uh, having flashbacks. On this side of the room, I'm looking at former firefighters that I represented as union president. <laughs> and I'm looking at union meeting. And then I'm looking at this side of the room, and with Judge Egan, who was a negotiator for the city, so with contract talks. And I don't know whether we could settle up on a few issues yet, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I think you still owe us some portion of a pay raise. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, I, I, I'm honored to be here. Uh, uh, we st first stepped into the Hall of Records when I was union president in 1993. Yeah, 1993. Uh, a family uh, uh, sent me some literature on a fire that occurred in 1892. It was the uh, Fort, Fort Orange Mill fire, and she had a a distant relative who was killed <coughs> in that particular fire. The four firefighters for Engine 4 died that day. Uh, it was the uh, greatest loss that we had for the fire department at one time. Uh, years later, 
walk in the door almost two years ago now, maybe even three. And uh, while the same people weren't here at, the, here at that time, uh, we were, I was warmly received along with my partner, uh, Tony Apalka, who's our museum director. And I want to uh, also note uh, Peter Hans, uh, Hans uh, who's walked into the credit union one day when we first formed as the museum and said, I want to be part of you guys. And uh, uh, his past history was an uh, was a auto mechanic and volunteer firefighter. And uh, now we, he's turned into our main researcher uh, at the hall here. Uh, I don't know if you ever saw Common Council minutes, uh, but they can be up to 600 pages. And he's been going back from 1790, uh, somewhere around there, and working his, all way, working his way up to 1867, which you're not there yet. Uh, you can just imagine the amount of time what he's doing is going through each book and looking up any related matter to the fire department. That means you have to go page by page because a lot of the, uh, the books aren't very clear as to uh, indexing the, uh, the fire department. It comes under uh, different titles and you have to be very uh, astute as to uh, what you're looking for. It's a uh, quill pen. Um, oh yeah, that's the other thing. Uh, just the first, that. yeah, uh, up to 18, starting 1850, it goes to print. Before that, uh, it's some very artistic script, uh, and then I think a lot of these guys must have been medical students because it's <laughs> it's tough to read. It's tough to read, and uh, you you have to spend a great deal of time just getting used to the the hand writing of that particular individual before you can start even beginning to read uh, what he was writing. 287 years is approximately the length of the fire department. Now it wasn't known as the fire department in 1732 when they purchased the uh, first uh, apparatus. It was a Newsham from uh, London and it, uh, they appointed three uh, men to oversee this particular piece. Uh, they uh, were paid six shekels. shekels a year of wheat. So I'm glad to hear that we started out as a pay department. Uh, what I'm going to be doing is giving you a timeline because I can't you know, 287 years, you're going to walk out of here after 15 minutes. Uh, you know, uh, you, people are familiar with fires. What we're emphasizing is the firefighter himself. What they went through in the 1700s, the 1800s, the 1900s, and now we're into 2000. And I'm, I'm part of the transition between the 1900s and the 2000s along with most of the other guys sitting here. Uh, in 1762, we went to our second uh, hand pumper. Now these things would produce about 70 gallons of water per minute when they were working properly. They had to be fed by buckets of water and, uh, they, and they relied on the citizens to come out and uh, to uh, supply the water. They would, they would be required to keep a bucket in their house, I guess. Uh, they had fire watch uh, that would go around ensuring that the, the ladders that they placed around the city were being used for what they were, and that was in case of a fire, you could get to the, the roof of these particular different buildings that were built at the time. Uh, 1790, we had our first recorded fire debts that we can locate at this time was, a, was an elderly couple in a residence. Uh, they perished. And it was the third pumper that the city had purchased at that particular time. It was, they were stored in sheds at this particular time. They weren't really formal firehouses in any sh uh, shape, but they were heated in order to keep the equipment uh, functional for winter uses. Uh, 1801, they created what we would know as the hand barrel, and we scratched our head, hand barrel company, and they were asking for guys to be appointed to this company uh, 
from, by the city uh, to um, uh, supplement the uh, different companies in the city with water. So I, uh, from what we understand now is that if you were to go down to Fasney's Museum in Hudson, you would see uh, a wagon with about a hundred buckets, leather buckets on it. And we assume that that's what this particular company was used for. I think they were used up to 1813, 1818. Uh, in 1801, uh, following the appointments of these gentlemen, there were, the, the department started to consolidate into more of a formal fire department. For example, when you walk out there, you'll see Engine 1 uh, formed in 1799, and you'll see uh, in the records there, by 1824, four gentlemen that had basically submitted their resignations for like a retirement purpose after 24 years of service to the department. At this time, still, the uh, hand pumpers were relatively small. It, it didn't require much energy to produce the water. Uh, by 1813, it was a company, one of my favorite companies right now, I think as we've been uh, researching, each of us that have been involved with the research have uh, favored a particular company. And the, the company that I selected was the D.D. Tompkins Company. It was formed in uh, 1813. It was uh, Engine 8 at the time, but they took, they, they took over the name D.D. Tompkins. Now, I know most of you would know who D.D. Tompkins is. He was the governor of New York. He was into a second term, and we believe this company's named after D.D. Tompkins, who was governor. And I, all, and I know that you all know this, that he was vice president under uh, Monroe in 1819. Uh, we try to find some records in regards to relating this to the fire department, and I guess the uh, Capitol fire uh, wiped out uh, a lot of his excuse me, records in 1911, uh, 19, thank you. Uh, so we're still looking for that. If we were to go to Albany Rural Cemetery, years ago, when, uh, my wife and I were driving through the cemetery, just to take a peek at it, and we noticed an obelisk, about 13, 14 feet tall, and it had a fire helmet. What the hell's that? So we went over and looked, and uh, it was D.D. Tompkins Obelisk. This company, fire company, even though they were disbanded around 1873, they uh, set this memorial up and where there was four members of that particular company that are, that are buried there. One particular person that stands out is, is Robert Bell. He was the foreman just before the Civil War started. He signed up for the Civil War. In 1861, he was killed. He was buried there. And uh, the thing is, is that uh, there's no marker indicating that he's a Civil War uh, veteran. Someday we would like to uh, pursue that particular matter, matter and, and have him honored. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, 1830, uh, the city uh, appoints a, a, a fire engineer, chief fire engineer. His duties are to assume to take over command of the fires uh, at, uh, at that time. Up to that point, it was like led up, led, the fires were directed by the aldermen and the mayor, whoever was available. I think with the aldermen a lot of times, it, because it was in their ward, and they would take command of the companies and how they functioned. It was at this particular time the development of a, uh, of a new uh, hand pumper was, came about. And I was surprised to learn that uh, Waterford, by uh, a company in Waterford, New York, produced this particular uh, uh, engine, and it was called a piano box. Uh, it was um, an, uh, an ala uh, a much greater capacity for uh, producing water, up to 200 gallons a minute. They could produce a stream of about 150 feet, but it started to require much more in manning. How much more? Well, in order to make this thing work, you needed about 30 men. 
and they would have a hand uh, brake that they would pull down on both sides of a particular piece. Uh, this p particular piece weighed about 3,300 pounds, and, and in order to produce the volume of water that they needed, they had to do 60 strokes a minute. Uh, they lasted anywhere from five, maybe to 10 minutes, 30 men, and then they have to rotate it. The department at this time started to grow to like seven, 800 men and they used to have to keep track to make sure that a lot, vast majority of these uh, firefighters were showing up in order to maintain what they were trying to do and accomplish with the, with the fires, and that's keep the water flowing. The um, Great Fire of 1848 took down about, burned down about 600 buildings downtown, along with many of the ships that were docked uh, boats, I should say, that were docked that particular period of time. In the same time, the boys were starting to get a little rowdy. There was a lot of pride competition between the companies. <coughs> and once in a while, they would, at a fire, have a little brawl. Who was arriving at the fire first? And, you know, who, was, who were the real men? Who were the real firefighters who knocked the fire down? And, you know, they might have a few beers before they arrived. And, uh, uh, it started to lead into riots. They would actually have riots at fires that would last from night to the morning to where they got to the point where one guy was shot and killed. Uh, at that time, in 1849, the department became a paid department. While Cincinnati claims that they're the first paid department in the United States, you know, they, uh, they started like in the 1850s. I'm not quite sure uh, what they're talking about. I think it's the continuous department from 1850s on up to, to present day. Uh, it was argued at the Common Council in 1848 that uh, Boston was a paid department and that New York City was volunteer. And they were weighing the difference between whether to have paid guys or volunteers uh, because of the pride of the community as a volunteer. So they came up with an annual uh, payment of $30 a, a year. And that was kind of like eh, 30 bucks. You know, it's like, I'd rather have my pride and, and do it for, for what we were doing it for as service to the community. So in 1851, they reverted back to a volunteer system. Now we're still researching that in terms of uh, what led to more of that, uh, the changeover. Uh, sometimes it, it, it just takes a while reading through the common council minutes uh, for a second or a third reading before you start to understand where they were going and where they were coming from. Uh, 1867, we went to a paid department, which is today uh, still existing. And 2017, we celebrated the 150th year. 1867, they went from hand pumpers basically to uh, steamers. And that was quite a transition because the fire, the, the, excuse me, the chief engineer at the time had to play politics. He had to stroke two parties. One, he had to stroke the volunteers, and he had somewhat had to stroke the uh, business community. If you, if you follow the history of cities <coughs> during this period, it's starting to get into its greatest growth of cities uh, because of the uh, changeover from f agriculture to, the, uh, to uh, 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 merchants, industry, where the, the, uh, the cities were the draw melting pot, the, draw, the drawing portion of the population. They were actually taking people from the farms to the, to the cities. Uh, so the, the uh, demand uh, for fire service was ever increasing. Like I said, in 1848, they had a conflagration. It was one of the first conflagrations in the United States in Albany. Uh, and following up in the 1860s, uh, Troy, New York had a conflagration. I, I don't remember the amount of buildings at the time, but <coughs> it, was, it was a great loss uh, to the city. Plus, they, I think they had more fire debts. Because you couldn't, sometimes you could not outrun these particular fires once they got to any magnitude. Uh, 
I, I assume at the time they had this, the same type of population. They had elderly, they had people with disability, they had people that were uh, incapacitated one way or the other, that they just couldn't get out of harm's way quickly enough. Uh, what they did was is that the business community in Albany, sometime before 1867, bought their own hand steamer, that they, they hand-drawn steamer. <coughs> Uh, and they incorporated that eventually, uh, they wanted to be incorporated into the fire department, but they were disbanded sometime in 1867 when the city went to horse-drawn steamers. Uh, the horse-drawn steamer uh, was uh, in competition with the hand-drawn pumper because the hand pumper could produce a greater stream for the first 10, 15, 20 minutes. But they did a little test and they found that after 10 hours that the boys weren't keeping up with the steam, stream, steamer at that particular time. It was a change in the evolution of the fire service. Steamers could produce at that time anywhere from 500 to 1,000 gallons a minute. The hand pumper was producing about 200 gallons per minute. With the, with the advent of larger buildings at the time, uh, they were very conscientious of fire. Matter of fact, when you read through the minutes of the Common Council, you'll see that one of the greatest the, uh, needs of that particular time was the fire department. And it just goes page after page where they, they, there's just a demand for, uh, for fire protection. They created fire codes in the city where they had, uh, you could only build brick buildings in certain areas of the city. Uh, they went to fireproofing uh, some of the first buildings, I think 1890, somewhere around that particular time. But they had great fires. And this is the period of time when we had the biggest loss of firefighters in the city. 20 guys from the old department transitioned over to the pay department that we know of at this time. And by the turn of the century, four of them had been killed. Uh, at that uh, at that point, I'm emphasizing the fact that you know guys were being killed, you know, from a, a grenade. It was a fire. It was a ball of, of mater uh, liquid material, and they used to use to toss in to, to extinguish. Somehow, he was killed by that way. Guys were killed uh, by being uh, stomped by a horse or fallen off apparatus. They didn't have the the, uh, the safety precautions that we have today. Mainly. The uh, demand that you see belt in. Matter of fact, you almost can't even start a truck today or an engine without being seat belted in. You know, the, the, the technology has changed so much. Uh, 1912 is when Ladder 4 was built on Delaware Avenue. And what's interesting is that at the same time, uh, Engine 6 had a motorized space for the chief's, one of the chief's cars. And yet in 1912, they still had horse stalls being built into the firehouse. 1924, was, uh, when Engine 11 was built on New Scotland Avenue, they introduced the kitchen. Up to this time, there were no kitchen in the firehouses. I, I'm beginning to think that the guys had a reason for this. Uh, they worked six days a week at that time, before uh, 1920s, and uh, they would go home for dinner and whatever else, and they come back and they get like one day off. Uh, it wasn't until they went to the two platoon system uh, in around 1922 that they uh, had a fight over that because the old timers kind of liked the one platoon system, and I think that there's reasons. Some a couple of you guys are smiling about it that, uh, uh, you know, the family was safe. We weren't that far from the family, but we were somewhat separated from the family, so we didn't have to listen to the, the wife and the kids on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it was an escape. And, uh, but the younger guys prevailed, I think, because uh, uh, they were, they saw the need uh, the, to get away from the firehouse. The um, interesting about 1912 is that uh, we're induced in the newspapers to stories about the animals of the firehouses. 
And one of my favorite is uh, about Boxer and Dad. Boxer is a tabby cat, three, third generation firehouse cat, and Dad is a white stallion that pulled one of the hose wagons at the time. And they had a favorite driver, the two of them, and the newspaper article goes on to say how buddy-buddy this cat and this horse were. How buddy-buddy? <laughs> they, the cat used to sleep on the hindquarters of the horse. <laughs> the cat would actually go to fires by hopping on the hose wagon uh, and, and go to the fire. Now, the horses themselves, you have to understand, w w weighed from anywhere from 1,100 to 1,700 pounds for the, for the different apparatus. And they had to overcome one particular thing, the fear of fire. So these horses were somewhat unique at the time in being able to uh, maintain their stature at a particular fire. And the story goes on uh, to where uh, we were meeting with a publisher of ours, and she said, you know what, that probably would make a good children's story, Dad and Boxer. So we are developing that particular uh, book at this time. And we're also developing another book, The History of the Albany Firehouses. And it's following through, the, starting with the sheds, going back to 1732, through the evolution of how, uh, of the change in firehouses and relating to the evolution of the fire apparatus. And along the way, we're introducing into this book stories of how the firefighters related to the neighborhoods and the neighborhoods related to the, uh, the fire houses at the time. And we're finding many stories about the horses. It seems that, uh, you know, people delighted in the, uh, in the horses, the cats, the dogs in the firehouses. So we're introducing that into the book itself. We hope to have that out by uh, next year, uh, early part of next year. Uh, the last of the fire ho ho horses was 1921. Uh, that's when the department completely motorized at that time. And they had an article in the paper about the last three fire ho uh, horses that were going out to uh, the auction. And, each, and they talked about the idiosyncrasy of each horse you know, uh, one horse loved to be um, rubbed by a woman, and he, uh, <laughs> I, uh, uh, I, I can't imagine uh, what that led to. But uh, you know, they had their own little <coughs> idiosyncrasies, and uh, uh, you uh, you often wonder what happened to the horse themselves. Uh, 1918, the uh, the fire department joined the IFF, that's the International Association of Firefighters. Now, I want to point out one thing. You know, today we're being politically correct, and we're, firefighters now sometimes are being referred to as fire persons. You'll hear this with, on the news. And yet, in 1918, they, they uh, separated from firemen, basically the firefighter. Because the fireman basically was one that attended the fire, like at, in the steamer or a boiler in a building or on an engine. So they went to the uh, term firefighter because that's what he was doing, fighting fires. So I, I submit that we were general neutral since 1918 and it's never been recognized. Um, 1922, we went to the two platoon system. Uh, 1924, again, I think we, we stepped into the age of the modern firehouse, which would have been engine 11 with the introduction of the kitchen. Prior to that, the bathroom would have been the biggest thing. And they had uh, the toilet would be on the first floor of the firehouse. They had a bathtub on the second floor where the dormitory was. Uh, the horse stables would be today's uh, kitchens in the, engine, in the older firehouses. Uh, 1930s, uh, the, uh, with the Roosevelt, they came with the WPA and they stripped a lot of the architecture off the buildings to give us what we have is those yellow type brick that you'll see on some of the firehouses today. They really were much prettier buildings at the time before that particular time. And one time we inquired, well, could we ever, when we were looking for a location for the museum, could we convert back to the original? And we found that you can't because they're being treated as historic and the value of going back to 1930. So it, it's, a, it's a lost cause. Uh, 
1930, uh, if there's any squad guys here, you're going to be upset with this. The squad was somewhat, rescue squad in 1930 was formed more or less to attend to medical calls. Today, uh, the uh, paramedics were affectionately referred to as black baggers in the firehouses. Uh, and believe me, it wasn't uh, uh, affectionate between the firefighters and the paramedics to a certain degree. Uh, but they were all paramedics, were all firefighters. They just stepped up to become a paramedic. Uh, they, in 1930s, they, oh, we found out the other day that they possibly had uh, 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 some type of iron lung that they used. They had a, di a, a different term, uh, neolators they had that they would respond to, to medical calls. Uh, 1959, uh, Marvin Cohn was appointed the first black, excuse me, first African American to the fire department. Marvin was a, was a great guy. He was over to my house because he was buddies with my father and the crew from engine uh, ladder two hung around together a great deal. And uh, Marvin obtained the rank of a captain where he would be a s uh, acting battalion chief at times. 1980s, we led to the, probably the biggest change in the department since the uh, uh, introduction of the motorized apparatus, and that was uh, emergency medical services. Uh, that led to a lot of upsetting uh, <laughs> times in the department, uh, not only with the membership, uh, but also with the, uh, convincing the city the, the need of this particular uh, uh, service. I know for a fact that many Albanians, people outside the city that we service, we did make a change in their lives. Uh, sometimes you couldn't help everybody, but the times that you did help somebody was, was rewarding. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that I dreamt every day of saving a life. I didn't. I did a 24-hour tour. Uh, sometimes the uh, tours for the beginning of the paramedic times were anywhere from like 18 to 20, 25 calls a day. And uh, it, was, it was tough, but y you enjoyed it. Uh, you were meeting a certain need to the population, a greater need. It gave you the opportunity to service people where uh, you, were, you were a comfort to them. I know for a fact that over the years, people would come up to you in the street and say, I remember you. And the first thing you think of is, what did they live? And, uh, <laughs> uh, and then so you say, you, you smile at them and you say, Can, you know, and, well, you were there to help my father. And the second thing you say is, how's he doing? And uh, he's doing great. Oh, great relief. Or he passed. But they would say thank you. And you only hoped that at that time you were, you were there along with the other guys, the EMTs who were on the engine and the truck company, companies that responded uh, to service these needs at that particular time. Uh, the name change. 1992, we had a radical name change. We had difficulty. Actually, since the union formed in 1970, we've had a major battle with the city. They really weren't warmly receiving a union within the ranks of the city. It's like the Catholic Church sometimes. My wife went through this uh, when the, they organized that LaSalle Institute. You know, the, uh, they talk union, they're proud to support the union, but we don't want it in-house. And uh, we, uh, we had problems with the cities. Uh, the police union went through the same thing. But now I think it's a, uh, uh, it's a much quieter time even though there are ruffles in the, in the system. It's nothing like it was when we first came on. So the name change went from uh, the Albany Fire Department to the Department of Fire Emergency Services. And that was meeting the needs of today's emergencies. If you, I, I can, if you can imagine what it was like before the 1990s compared to what it is today, how quiet it was in terms of of emergencies that were uh, that are being generated not only through uh, accidental but through the acts of terrorism it's a whole change in the, in the in society and the fire department has to keep up with that they're, they're the first line of defense for many of the these calls 
and people expect you to be able to function in that. Now, sometimes it's a strictly a defensive mode, and other times it's an offensive. But people expect you to be there for them at that particular time. And there's nothing worse standing there looking at something and, and, and having a question in your mind. Fire department, you're trained to move forward. You have to respect that in terms of common sense, but you have to understand the fact that the call that you're sent on is not of your making, but and sometimes you went on a call that you wish you weren't there for, but the point being is, is that you couldn't back down from it. Today's fire department firefighter is facing a new sur scourge, and that's cancer. There seems to be an uptick in cancer uh, developing among the younger firefighters. And the museum is going to be exploring uh, that to make the public more aware of this particular concern that we have. Um, in my research, uh, I've found, like I said, several people that stand out that you, you kind of identify with. One was a, a William Bridgeford. He was a 14, 15 year old drummer in the Civil War. He was at Little Round Top with the 44th. And if you've ever been to Gettysburg, looking down on from Little Round Top, you have the 20th, you have the 83rd Maine, and you have the 44th Albany, or New York. And here's this guy, 14, 15 years old. Uh, drumming his little heart out during this particular time. He later became the fire chief of the fire department, and he uh, uh, was chief, I think, between like 1916 and uh, 1923, 24, somewhere in there. He saw the transition between horse and motorization. <clears throat> there were the Luby brothers. Two of them died on the job, killed, and one died. Uh, of natural causes while on the job. Uh, there are family traditions within the fire department. F we see throughout the, the, uh, the history of the department where family will occupy a time frame within the fire department. We have today many <coughs> families that are involved from one generation to the next. It's part of the tradition of the fire department. What we're trying to do with the museum is to, again, bring alive the individual firefighter, not necessarily the names, but what they had, <coughs> but how they uh, worked through the system at that particular time, how they met with the community, uh, how they met the community needs at that particular time. Uh, I'm going <coughs> to close here. Because I don't want to give you too much information because I'd rather have you, once we open up, come and visit the museum. And then we can talk more about the history of the department. And somebody might have, well, I, I know this for a fact, and you were wrong about it. That's fine. But today's not the time. But I will take any questions that you might have at this point. All right. This, if there's no questions, I just want to take time out to thank the Albany Hall of Records, they have really been <coughs> tremendous in meeting our needs. When we first came in here, we had to introduce ourselves. That's when we, we brought in our secret weapon, Tony Apaka, <laughs> the city, and things opened up. I mean, they were great. They were great when we first came in here as, uh, as an unknown, but once Tony came on board, uh, uh, they understood that we were uh, serious about what we were trying to accomplish. Uh, and since that time, uh, I can't say enough about it. The only thing I would say is that they need more room for display. You know, uh, he's been trying to convince me of this since he walked in the door. I said, Bill, I just went through one point eight million dollar project. I don't think the county legislature will let me buy another building right now. Well, <laughs> it's funny that you bring that up. We're looking at a building. At, we're we're going to be uh, at this time moving into a three. Uh, 84 Broadway. What we're doing is kind of setting up an, an, an exhibit of what we like the, the museum to move into. And, we, and we'll get the word out and we would love to have you come in. 
But the real building that we're looking at is down the street, the old trailways building. Mm -hmm. And if you can step back, and if you're familiar with that building, <coughs> the reason why we like that building is twofold. <coughs> One, we feel that the downstairs where the buses used to come in could be glass enclosed. And we have a couple pieces our eye on from the State Museum that we would like to uh, show <coughs> as a show piece. And uh, that would give us exposure to the public on a 24-hour basis if we were to light these pieces up. Second of all, the second floor, the uh, second floor, we wanted to make a commercial venture to offset the cost of the museum. We've been talking to other museums in the area, Irish Heritage Museum. Uh, uh, we have a good rapport with the Schuyler Mansion. And uh, we understand that we could collectively create a hub uh, for the city with s the smaller museums as a draw for downtown. It wouldn't be an overall expense to the city, but it would create one thing that downtown needs is foot traffic. And with foot traffic, you have uh, other shops coming in. So we do feel that we're a po we could be a positive effect on the city in those regards. We're going to be very aggressive in obtaining that building. Now what we have up our sleeve is that the architect whose building we're in at this time, Jack Waite, is a renowned architect involved in preservation of historic buildings. And when my first meeting with him, he said, you know, I got the perfect building for you. And I said, what's that? And he says, the Trailways Building. So many times people will say to me, Bill, you know, you, you got pipe dreams. You know, you, you're dreaming as a fireman, firefighter that uh, this building can come reality. And I say, you're right, you're right. But you know what I have is I have this particular gentleman, Jack Waite, the architect, who just completed uh, the uh, Cincinnati Union Terminal. It's a 550,000 square foot train station. They converted it into four museums at a cost of $228 million. So you know what? Until he says, Bill, this is not a viable project for you, we're going ahead full steam. So if you hear the, about the tra Trailways building, that's where we're, we're coming from with that. And with that, I want to close, because I think I'm running, oh God, I probably went over more than I should have. But uh, uh, I, I encourage you to stay for a few minutes. The display is great. I want to thank Rebecca. She really put together a great display. I learned a lot more. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. I hope I didn't go too long. No, you're fine. Bill, that was great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, during the introductions, I neglected to tell you who I was, by the way. I'm Bruce Hidley. I'm your Albany County Clerk. Uh, and once again, thank you for being here today. Um, I'd just like to give you a couple of quick memories that I have. Uh, I've lived in the city of Waterville now for over 38 years, but I grew up in Albany. I am an Albany native. I grew up uh, off of uh, Morris Street in Albany, and then my family moved over to Delaware Avenue, where I graduated from Cardinal McCluskey High School. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I was the last year it was open in 1977. I was the class president, and I worked on the merger council with Vincentian Institute. It was quite the, quite the program. But the, the reason why I bring that up is because I have two very vivid memories. Um, I think it was approximately 1964. I was six years old, and uh, I remember... Uh, my fa father and mother saying, uh oh, something's going on. It's, it's pretty big, whatever it is. And uh, as young as I was, I still got up and went outside. And it was the old Arania Club on Allen Street. It was up in flames and it was, it was, it was, it was just a, it was a mess. It was a terrible fire. And I watched the firefighters uh, work that fire and, and drop it down and save the building. Uh, it was, it was quite, a, quite a job for them. And the second vivid memory I have is when the Mohawk Airline uh, airplane dropped into the ground uh, just off of between Western Avenue and Washington Avenues. And I was very young at that point, too. And, and the emergency medical services, uh, the police, the fire, and everybody came together and worked that, uh, that terror horrific crash. 
and uh, it's just those are just two memories that I have from, uh, as a very young lad in the city of Albany and watching and experiencing what the fire departments and police departments and the emergency medical people were able to do. But one, one very uh, vivid memory in, in my life, uh, for 22 and a half years I served as a city clerk in the city of Waterville. And my wife woke me up one morning and said, Bruce, you need to get downstairs and you need to get downstairs now. I'm like, oh, geez, what's wrong? And she says, you need to um, watch the news. And on the news uh, was the death of Waterville Fire Chief Thomas McCormick who uh, served as the father of mutual aid, and he died uh, during a mutual aid fire response from the city of Waterville over to the city of Troy. And uh, that was quite a blow to all of us in the city of Waterville. Uh, Tom was a great guy. And, um, you know, we thank Tom for a lot of things in, in our firefighter careers today, uh, especially with mutual aid, because without mutual aid, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, and I, I know many of you are firefighters here, uh, you know what it's like to have assistance from other companies come in, either to just to watch your houses while you're, you know, fighting some t horrific fire somewhere. Uh, but uh, Chief Thomas McCormick was the uh, father of uh, mutual aid, and uh, when he passed, we, we lost a great guy. And it brought the firefighter communities together because um, they traveled from other states. They traveled from all over New York State. Uh, the buses that came in, the fire trucks that came in from all over to honor Tom when he passed away, uh, the, as, as we see quite often, the large flag that is flown between two ladders uh, over uh, overseeing it was, was just uh, an incredible uh, to, to see. And, uh, it don't, and the final memory that I have is, um, he, uh, Bill mentioned the Delaware Avenue. Uh, I grew up on Summit Avenue, and um, one day I came home and uh, my father was not responding and uh, I, I didn't even know where he was in the house so I just kept going around and finally I found him in the bedroom and uh, the, you know we called uh, uh, the firehouse right away and the Delaware Avenue station came over and quickly responded to my father and got him back uh, to where he was he was breathing again and everything but it comes if what we found out as they transported him to um, St. Peter's Hospital was the fact that he had had a stroke. But it was the Albany Fire Department that, uh, that did the, a great, tremendous job on my father, reviving him and bringing him back to life, although, you know, he had some repercussions afterwards. That same day that that happened, it was the same day that my mother died. And uh, it was quite a blow for our family to see my mother pass away. And then I come home and have my father in bed, almost dead, with a stroke himself. So the Albany Fire Department uh, did a great job reviving my dad that day, and it's it's a memory that you just don't forget. And even in my in my own time, um, I thought I was having a massive heart attack one one morning, and I I woke my wife up and said, you know, we need to do something. She called 911, and the Waterville Fire Department responded to my house, and um, you know, in today's in today's firefighter world, uh, paramedics and EMTs. They're just tremendously professional people and know what they're doing when it comes to emergencies. And um, they got me and transported over to uh, Samaritan Hospital in Troy and found it wasn't a massive heart attack, but it was a gallbladder attack. <laughs> but, you know, again, my, my point is the professionalism of all the fire department agencies uh, around our area is just tremendous, and we're very proud of that. And. Um, I, I extremely tip my hat to all of you who have served uh, as either a firefighter or a policeman or an EMT, a paramedic, or whatever that, uh, whatever that uh, particular uh, line of work was that you did. Um, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your service. Uh, it's a tremendous service. I had many, many of my fellow classmates, uh, Jack Kent, uh, Pete Lennox, they were all firefighters in the city of Albany who now I think Pete's son is now a firefighter in the city of Albany. Um, it's, it's just a tremendous honor. And finally, um, our county executive is presenting his 2020 budget at 1.30 this afternoon, but he sends his regrets that he couldn't be here today. Um, Dan McCoy is a 19-year retired veteran of the Albany County Fire Department and the City of Albany Fire Department and really, really wanted to be here today 
but it just uh, was, you know, just was not, he just couldn't do it. There was just too much to get ready for for 1.30 this afternoon. So he sends his hellos to everybody and he says his thanks for being here. Uh, our county executive is a tremendous partner with us here at the Albany County Hall of Records and my other office, the Albany County Clerk's Office. And uh, we're very grateful for that partnership that we have with the Albany County Executive. The Albany County Legislature, uh, I can't say enough. Um, I go to them quite often for proposals for needs here. Uh, we've come a, such a long way in the Albany County Hall of Records with technology that uh, our IT department in Albany County couldn't meet the needs staff-wise for what we needed here now. So that's where Ricardo came in. Uh, he now has taken over all of our IT work here in uh, Albany County Hall of Records, and he's doing a dynamic job with it. Uh, thanks to the New York State Local Government Records and Management Improvement Fund, uh, and uh, our, you've met Vincent Camisso in the back, who's worked diligently on three grants that we have received. Um, most recently, uh, we're gonna be working on uh, digitizing our pistol permit records here and we're working with the town of Colony on a very special project for the town clerk's office. We were awarded 149,900 and some dollars. This is our third grant that we've been awarded in some five years. We're excited about that project, and we, I, you know, I want to acknowledge our New York State Archives uh, representatives who are here today and say thank you for everything you do to make us uh, a better uh, county and to produce the records that we need to produce.